Well, welcome to our final plenary session on supply chain and sustainability. Um, it's a very important topic to all of our fashion companies today. Uh, our moderator is Rick Rellinger. He is with our corporate sponsor, PVH Corporation, and he's the Vice President of Corporate Responsibility. So welcome, Rick, and welcome to all of the panelists. And we look forward to hearing some of your ideas about how we can make our products more sustainable and environmentally friendly and so forth. So thank you. Go ahead, Rick. Great. Thank you, Beverly. Well, a pleasure to join everybody today and exciting that we've heard corporate responsibility topics brought up on uh, several of the discussions this morning. So I think uh, perfect timing to bring together a group of experts on the topic who were different hats within the industry. Um, so I'll do a brief round of introductions. We're joined by Arash Azadagan, the Associate Professor of Supply Chain Management uh, and Supply Chain Disruption Research Laboratory at the Rector's Business School. Uh, Amy Hall, the Vice President of Sociousness, I. Fisher. David Bolesco, Vice President at the Levy Group and Sophie Weitzman, my colleague also at PVH, who's Vice President of Supply Strategy. Um, so what we really wanted to open the call and conversation with today is recognizing the role of corporate responsibility in global supply chains. As we look at current events, um, this is something that's really emerging uh, as the industry plays a key role in the broader global economy. Um, so whether it's COVID-19 and dialogue in the media, around impacts on worker well-being, job security, and wages associated with the apparel industry, or climate change, as we see now 200 companies committing to uh, uh, science-based targets to drive the, the role of business in addressing our ambition uh, to have limiting global temperatures to rise 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. We also see emerging interest from investors. A uh, new McKinsey survey looked at uh, the role of ESG programs, environmental, social, and governance, and seeing that 83% of C-suite leaders and investment professionals expect that ESG programs will contribute more to shareholder value in five years relative to today. And also the role of government, um, whether it's emerging, again, in, in media, uh, the role of the U.S. government on challenges with forced labor, or in the European Union, looking at laws governing mandatory due diligence. So we see, again, the role of the apparel industry um, becoming more and more uh, tied with sustainability in the supply chain. Um, so with that, again, a, a incredibly great opportunity here with the panelists uh, who are experts in each of their fields um, to talk through us on this topic. And Arash, uh, really wanted to open it up with you um, as a professor um, and how you've seen sustainability incorporated into your supply chain curriculum and how that has evolved over this time. Thanks for the opportunity and uh, thanks for uh, having me. It's a great pleasure to be uh, part of this a wonderful panel of uh, experts uh, um, among industries. And, uh, and uh, again, um, I feel humbled to be able to, to go first on, uh, on opinions with regards to that. You know, sustainability has, um, as, as, as uh, uh, Rick, you mentioned, has evolved over the years. Uh, and means a lot uh, to uh, many uh, different folks as, as we discuss, and David also uh, alluded to this point in our earlier conversations. Um, in, in our uh, discussion, uh, sustainability uh, is you know, related to the triangle of uh, uh, people, uh, planet, and profit. And each one of those we try um, in, in what we uh, um, provide to the students is to allow them to recognize that sustainability is a continuous maintenance in all three of those areas. So I was just in a different uh, listening in to a panel earlier about uh, human rights and worker rights overseas uh, on one side and on the other side, um, the discussion about, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, agricultural aspects and ability for us to get the raw materials from, from the earth. And at the same time, for, uh, you know, when it comes to COVID at this moment in time, unfortunately, there are many businesses that revenues have become very, very difficult. Um, I'll finish this uh, early uh, comment um, by um, saying that, uh, 
you know, um, colleagues, uh, I work with a lot of uh, uh, garment manufacturers in Bangladesh, and, and they're concerned about how downstream members of the uh, supply chain um, are ever not so concerned about them at this point. And I have to tell them, look, um, you know, just like in an airplane, you have to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can put it on other people. And unfortunately, we're all in that same boat. So um, back to uh, your, so this is a long way of going around to answer your question with regards to, uh, uh, you know, what we do in terms of education. Um, it's an ongoing uh, adaptability on the education side as well to um, let the students uh, know that sustainability or uh, dare I suggest that sustaining a sustainability curriculum also requires adjustment and change. And so new cases, uh, new situations, and also bringing in, we're fortunate with um, the uh, MSBF program to have students that are in uh, the garment industry or are interested enough to bring in. So what we try to do is to, to actually ask the students to bring in their own thoughts and uh, discussions become um, you know, um, the most important aspect or part of the uh, important aspect of the classroom. Thanks so much for pro Professor. And in terms of that context in the dialogue, both within academia and with the, the students of the Rutgers Business School. Um, to that point, I want to move on to then Amy. Um, Amy is a, a leader in the industry on sustainability and also from a, a, a brand, Eileen Fisher, that's recognized as a sustainable company. How has your work uh, really drived integrating sustainability into your supply? So um, thank you. Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, you know, we have been working at this for a very long time and it started with um, human rights and looking at the welfare, well-being of the people in our supply chain. And now, um, you know, and then over the years, integrating um, environmental standards into our supply chain. And now what we're doing as of the last couple of years is really going all the way down to the farm level. So, you know, it's one thing to start at the finished product level, which is where most of us start, to, um, to kind of work backwards. You start with the finished product level, you look at the people there and um, the minimal environmental impacts that they have, and then work backwards down the, down the chain. Um, what we're trying to do now is shift the, um, shift the conversation to start at the farm level. So we're looking at how are the fibers grown? Are they grown organically? Are they grown regeneratively? That would be the ideal. Um, and work up to nominated suppliers and up and up the ladder that, that until we get to the finished goods supplier. So we really are trying to look at every step along the way. We have a long way to go before we can say we're actually covering our whole supply chain, but we've had some success in this, with this new model um, with regard to wool. And um, we're trying to finish out our wool supply chain and then hopefully move on to new fibers after that. It's a very um, long process. It involves establishing relationships with suppliers that we wouldn't have had connections to, to necessarily in the past and building trust and, and that's how we're doing it. I think Amy, some key points for us to take later in the conversation in terms of building trust with your partners in the supply chain and working from that immediate business relationship to really digging in further upstream in the supply chain are, are certainly emerging trends, um, which I think brings us then to David. Um, David, in your role as SVP uh, of Taylor Clothing, Dress Furnishings and Sourcing, how then do you work to integrate sustainability into your supply chain when you're servicing many different brands and accounts? Well, thank you for having me. And that's a very interesting question because to the Levy Group, we are servicing from the opening price point right up through the um, higher price points in the market. So it's a very interesting conversation how you adapt sustainability into all levels of your price points because it's very, very important from a consumer perspective what you can um, or how much added cost you can put into a certain product. Everybody likes to talk about sustainability. It's a kind of a sexy thing to talk about. Everybody wants to help the environment. Everybody wants to do the right thing. Um, at the Levy Group, um, we use a lot of traceability um, with the different mills that we use. Everything starts for us. Everything starts, yes, with the fiber, but everything goes to fabric. You know, fabric for us is really the key ingredient into making a great product in the lower level or the upper level or the mid-level. Every fabric has to get finished with a finishing plant. 
So most finishing plants use more water than anyone can possibly imagine. So that's kind of way we look at it. So we start there. Um, we try to add it into different brands and really see what the added cost is gonna be and how much the consumer can absorb to that added cost. It's kind of a really tricky issue. Nobody really wants to pay more for product. That's, you know, especially with everything going on today, if you take a look at who's driving the consumer, um, the consumer sales, it's mostly the off-price market. It's places like Nordstrom's Racks and Burlington and Marshalls and any place Macy's backstage. Um, most places and most people want to pay more of a moderate price for something, whether it's luxury or whether it's opening price point. So it's, a, it's, it's kind of trying to figure out that combination that'll give you the right sustainability to talk about and that you can prove and that you can cost effectively to make sure your consumer will actually buy into it. If your consumer doesn't buy into it, then, you know, while talking about sustainability is great and talking about traceability and doing the right things for the environment and for, you know, the people who are producing your product all over the world, if your consumer doesn't buy into it, then you've got a real issue. So it's a, it's a really tricky equation that you have to figure out. It's easier in the higher price points because passing along eight to 12%, not a big deal. No one's really looking at it. It's very, minis, very minimal. Opening price point, you try to pass some of those costs along, it's a much more difficult equation. So it's tricky. It just really depends upon how you're looking at it and what the consumer will uh, accept and absorb. Hope I've answered the question. Absolutely, David. And I, I think bring up two critical points in, in terms of how much of this is driven by the expectations of the consumers. And then how do we think about that relative to what's becoming table stakes in the industry um, of consumers at various price points? And I, I think that's a good segue to Sophie. Um, and if Sophie, you can talk through us a, again, is how from a PVH perspective, you see sustainability factoring into your supplier uh, partnerships um, and to the extent to which that's integrated into the way that you do business um, from a supply chain perspective um, in your role as supply strategist. Great, thank you, Rick. Um, I think it's a really important question um, and really a foundation of how we do business. So I would say first and foremost, supplier selection really comes down to values. Um, I'm a strong believer in having aligned values and if you can really see eye to eye there, then the rest often can take care of itself. So. If you think about a marriage or a personal relationship, when it works, it works, and when it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, and so you really have to have a level of trust with anyone who is contributing to the success of your business, like a supplier, and it takes time to build that. So we don't approach these relationships lightly. Um, and we found over the years that you can't really approach supplier relationships with cost as your only filter. Um, often when you approach from a cost first lens, you end up with too many suppliers and very transactional relationships. So our approach at PVH has really been to partner with fewer and better suppliers. And we've also found that when you do um, approach from cost, uh, you don't actually get to take advantage of other value drivers that some of the most strategic and best apparel manufacturers out there will provide. And some of those examples are, you know, some of the best uh, suppliers that we work with invest a lot in research and development. Um, they deliver cutting edge innovation to us before they bring it to other people. Um, they stand up capabilities like automation, 3D design and development. They're at the cutting edge of building facilities in new sourcing regions like East Africa. Um, and of course, they're investing in sustainability. So in their workers, in the environment, um, in women's empowerment programs like PACE, clean water initiatives. And they often make the investments not really because they have to, but because they believe um, in the long-term competitive advantage. So those are the types of suppliers that we like to build strong lasting relationships with. Um, and then specifically at PVH, which Rick, you know very well, um, sustainability is a big focus. We have the forward fashion program. Um, we've publicly committed to targets that we'll deliver against over the next 10 years. And we really stood up this program because we believe it's the right way to do business. Um, 
And, you know, if you look into the program, there's a lot of different targets around clean water, around workers' rights, around sustainable product, um, and many different areas of the business. And in order to really drive progress against these targets, we need to bring our supply chain partners along. Um, and we won't be able to do that if we have hundreds of transactional suppliers that we need to influence. So we really need the leverage. And we find that with fewer and better strategic uh, best in class suppliers. Um, so I guess to sum it up, sustainability really starts with the sourcing strategy. It's a filter that we apply um, and we use that to grow our partnerships. And we found that as we continue to give, you know, more business to suppliers, it's often the ones who are meeting our social and environmental KPIs. So we're rewarding those best suppliers with more business. And then lastly, one thing I just want to point out is that we've also found that um, often best in class suppliers that embrace lean principles and really look end to end across their manufacturing process to remove waste. Um, those are often the, the same suppliers that use that approach for sustainability. So they're looking to remove waste. They see it as a cost. Um, how do they reduce energy? How do they, how do they reduce water consumption? So it's kind of all connected. Um, so I guess to sum it up, sustainability is incredibly important and a, a really critical filter that we use um, when we're driving, evolving, and really growing those partnerships with our key suppliers. I think Rick might be frozen. Or maybe on mute. Are you there, Rick? Hey there, I'm back now. Okay, good. Uh, is the bandwidth better? Yeah, you're good. Great. Sorry about that. And, and you know, very much getting used to as, as we're all in a, a new world and getting used to virtual conferences. I'm um, so appreciate everybody's understanding there, which I think, you know, is pulling out some of the themes uh, that uh, everybody as part of the panel spoke about. You know, we're living in today a, a world in terms of geopolitics that is incredibly volatile and moving quickly. And um, Amy, you know, you touched on the point about how important it is to have those supplier relationships. I think Sophie, you spoke to a lot of the connections between sustainability and the supply chain strategy. David, you mentioned that as a kind of a baseline as you're thinking about your supply chain strategy, especially looking upstream to those fabric suppliers. Um, and I think the, the role in the consumer is really critical for us to think about is given all the geopolitics geopolitical volatility, where is the consumer going? Um, so wanted to open it up a question for all of the panelists to jump in on is, how do you see consumer behavior and consumer preferences uh, shifting amidst all of the geopolitical changes, especially um, as it relates to COVID-19? And to what extent does that influence your sustainability priorities in each of your respective businesses? Well, and I'll jump on that first. So, you know, sort of what I said before, where we see growth in the market today is really in the off-price channel. So, you know, we're looking at our supply chain much differently than we did even two years ago um, and how price sensitive products are. So um, we're spending more time um, from a supply chain trying to find um, places in the world, for example, like Ethiopia. It's a, it's a duty-free country in the United States. We're working with, and very similar to what kind of what, what Sophie said about finding the right partners who are doing the right thing, both for the environment and for their, and for their, um, for their workers. So we're partnering with a, a couple of facilities there that grow crops right next to the facility, provide lunches and provide health and provide a lot of different um, um, uh, healthcare options for a lot of their workers. So we see that as a big benefit. Now we also get the added benefit of it being duty free to the United States. So we can afford to pay more for products like that um, with all the benefits that come with it. So we're looking for different situations from a supply chain that we can take advantage of things, giving us the ability to pay more, um, but because of duty and other advantages that we take from, you know, from participating in production in that part of the world, we're able to bring it in and still sell it in the channels that we need to be successful. Rick, if I can jump in. Um, I think, you know, thank you, David. Some really interesting points there. Um, I think as we, you know, as the, the world evolves and the industry evolves, uh, we're seeing even 
you know, more new business models that are scaling up. So rental, uh, refurbished, recycled, circular. Um, fast fashion is, you know, is starting to decline. Um, consumers are, are more concerned with transparency than they have been in the past. Um, and I think while, you know, Europe is a lot faster to adopt some of these um, more forward thinking models, um, the US has maybe a bit to go. Um, I think it's it's not necessarily when are consumers and, and the market going to adjust to sustainability, it's, it's how and how can we make that happen? Um, and, and how can we, you know, take a, a longer term view to ensure that we're, we're doing the right things today so that we can be set up to win in the future. I think it's really about embracing a new normal and having the courage to change and, and making some of those changes now so that we can win tomorrow. Um, I'll just jump in with a couple of things that I've, I've been hearing. Uh, I was on another panel of, I don't know, a month or two back and somebody said that the, the uh, number of internet searches for um, sustainable, so quote unquote, sustainable apparel since December has increased by um, double digit percentage points. So uh, there's something about the pandemic that has raised people's awareness around um, the interconnectedness of the world and has put it together with fashion, coupled with the fact that we've been buying less overall. And um, I think, you know, David makes a good point that um, price sensitivities has been very, very important right now. Um, that said, I think people in general are starting to question, you know, how much stuff do they really need? And so, um, you know, our company hasn't, has, has seen a huge dip in sales um, through the pandemic. And we're not really sure where this is going to lead. Uh, if, if there will be, um, how much of our former um, revenues will we be recovering? And, um, but we are pinning a lot of our um, ongoing and future um, activity on our sustainability efforts, because we know that that connects with our customers and we see this kind of uptake in, in interest going forward. So that will remain a key part of our strategy, business strategy going forward. I think, I think a lot of uh, what has uh, been, um, um, my colleagues here have, have covered quite a bit of what's important. I'll just add by saying, you know, um, uh, COVID and, and the notion of uh, the pandemic, uh, it will be a blip as we're looking at it. I wasn't so optimistic about it, but it seems like there will be a vaccine and uh, how many months or, you know, a year or whatever else we're going to get out of it. The question of, you know, how is that going to change consumer behavior afterwards? I have a sense that, uh, and this is just pure speculation, not necessarily based on any empirical um, that the sensitivity of the consumer towards more um, healthy um, and uh, medically um, um, sanitary, if you will, and um, disease-free um, uh, and um, uh, um, is, is more important. So uh, be it in terms of trace minerals, be it in terms of um, lead or whatever else, so that level of sensitivity is going to be raised because now we are going to be very much more concerned about our health, not just about, um, you know, the respiratory aspects, but I think, I think we're all going to be more concerned about what we wear and how that impacts, um, you know, be it the skin or whatever other type of health and associated with that by default throughout the supply chain. So uh, leather tanneries and whatever else, I think folks are going to be much more concerned about that as to what that impacts. So, you know, what COVID is provided is to uh, look at sustainability beyond uh, just the, the effect, uh, effects on planet, but rather the effects on uh, um, uh, humans, right? The, the human race and uh, how, um, uh, easy it is for us to contaminate each other and if that means through the supply the supply chain becomes a carrier then I think that's one uh, one uh, um, uh, spectrum if you will or one ve vector for which we're going to be concerned about well Rick you know, Thanks I, think so much, I think it, I think an interesting oh, ahead, is the you know what's happened during COVID has really changed um, the way consumers act and where they buy we know that Costco and Sam's and BJ's and play, you know, those, those, those consumer clubs were very, played a big role during COVID because they were the only place open. 
I think the question really is for the future is, is that the way the consumer is going to keep shopping? Because a lot of these clubs picked up a lot more members or are consumers eventually going to go back to shopping the way they used to? We don't know the answer to that yet, but we know that the impact of the clubs have been uh, pretty substantial because increased sales for them um, uh, in, in the past in, in you know, items that had nothing to do with, with apparel, but now we're seeing apparel sales there really at um, all time highs. And I'm not, I don't know the answer whether that is sustainable or whether consumers are going to go back to shopping at the places they used to shop for apparel. Thank you, David. And I think a great context uh, to Professor Zadigan's point. I just want to note and reference, uh, encourage people to use the Q&A function. We have some great questions coming in, so please keep them coming. Um, Amy, go ahead, and, and then we'll look at, at the questions that are coming in. From um, let me just add one other thing, if I may. And again, um, as an academic, I tend to, you know, uh, we are going to be looking at this. One of my colleagues is actually here, um, Ayana, and we were looking at the patterns that are going to be coming up in terms of consumer behavior. And uh, um, uh, many of us um, are uh, immigrants, right, and, and have associations with the old country uh, where uh, travel and being outside and outdoors is quite a lot limited and so folks actually have garments um, and their fashion not necessarily for the outdoors but for the indoors right i'm um, talking about middle eastern countries or more conservative countries um, and we associate with that especially for for, for ladies as, as something that's covered and you know fashion doesn't mean anything but heavens if you go inside the the ro the, the houses and you'll see how much uh, um, uh, money, um, how much effort is put into place into the fashion. So I think one consumer pattern that we're going to see, be it with COVID or after COVID, is the internal design and internal fashion as opposed to what's what's for walking up and down, uh, you know, Fifth Avenue uh, or, uh, a, 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 you know, going to a, um, you know, an opera rather than just being around fam family and friends for that purpose. I'm not a designer. I don't know how that's going to be an impact, but I'm pretty sure the way that the, the dresses uh, and, and the blouses and the shirts are going to be associated is going to be more based on what what closer friends consider rather than what, uh, let's say, colleagues do at work. Amy, I just wanted to check if you were coming in there. No, I hadn't tried to say anything. Okay, great. Could be glitches with the uh, bandwidth challenges here. Um, so, so I wanted to, to touch on a theme here and uh, seeing through some of the questions and thank you again for folks sending these through is the, the question again is to what extent um, is sustainability priorities being driven by the consumer? And as folk, folks spoke about, you know, a, a challenge retail sector, you know, uh, given the global pandemic kind of impact on the wallet and people's disposable income to be able to, sp to spend um, on apparel and clothing. And David is the point you make looking at, you know, which channels are consumers shopping in? Are we looking at the, the consumers looking for value in the marketplace? Are we looking for those looking for, for luxury? Um, and as you think about your sustainability work ahead, I, I think uh, as Professor Azadagan spoke about, you know, seeing a more informed and enlightened consumer, uh, you know, looking across the different segments of uh, the consumer base, uh, that folks are, are getting smarter and seeing a question, uh, a connection between how their, their clothes are made, um, how their clothes are used, um, to uh, uh, what they're seeing in, in uh, current events um, and the, the, the uh, broader impact on society. Um, so we we'll open it up. I, we, we got a question from Nathan. Thank you so much. Um, specifically to Sophie, but I'll open it up to the group, is this kind of chicken or egg question, um, almost the sense of how much of sustainability is being driven through your organization because you see operational opportunities and this is the way that you see um, kind of business advantage um, in terms of your operating model especially as you look through your supply chain. And to what extent is that also driven by a company saying, this is our set of values and priorities, and we think this is going to be uh, speaking to our consumers. Um, so wanted to open that up to the group in terms of how you look at the future, knowing that there certainly is uncertainty about how uh, our global economy recovers from COVID and thinking about your sustainability priorities for your supply chain um, in the coming months and years. 
I'm happy to take that one first, Rick. Um, I think it's a bit of both. I think um, as you're familiar with the forward fashion targets that we've set at PVH, again, to touch back on that, it's really because we feel at PVH that that's the right way to do business. And, and obviously we have the scale and the resources to make that a priority. Um, I, I would say for some smaller companies, it's probably a bit more difficult uh, to really put that uh, front and center as a, as a corporate uh, priority and strategy. Um, but I do think, you know, as we move forward, consumers are going to expect that. Maybe they don't today, um, maybe they won't tomorrow, but in the next five to 10 years, I mean, we live in a, a wor the world with uh, finite resources and we have a responsibility. So whether, you know, it, there's a short-term cost impact that we're seeing today, um, I think we're all going to be, you know, in, in 10 years wishing we had uh, driven this agenda um, a bit more seriously and a bit faster, um, kind of seeing how the world is going at this point. Yeah, at Eileen Fisher, I think we've probably had a very similar path as PVH. You know, I can remember a decade or more ago um, when our design team would go out sourcing fabrics and yarns, um, they would tell us sort of an anecdotal story about how they would, um, you know, walk up to the table at a trade show and the, the, um, the vendor would pull out from underneath the table the one thing they had that was organic and just show it to, to our team. Now when they approach the team, the, the tables, they're, you know, plenty of organic and otherwise, um, quote unquote, sustainable fibers available. Similarly, when we've sourced suppliers, you know, we used to have to, it was, it was always an uphill battle, um, finding kind of the best we could find 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and trying to work with them to ramp up. Nowadays, we go out, we look for suppliers. There's so many that are already doing amazing work both on behalf of their, um, their workforce, as well as on behalf of their practices and the environment. So it's very much a, um, a partnership now. It used to be more one-sided where we would be pushing our, our values out. So um, the world has definitely changed, changed for the better. However, there's, you know, there was a recent article, I was just looking at it in Business of Fashion that says we're not doing enough yet as, a, as, a, um, as an industry. The 2030 um, carbon goals are, are fast approaching and very few companies have set bold enough um, goals to, um, to pull our carbon emissions down um, below the 1.5 um, parts per million uh, goal that we need to have. So um, things are getting better, but it's not going fast enough just to echo what Sophie already said. Well, you know, I would I would agree with that. You know, it, and and this we wouldn't be having this kind of conversation five years ago. Um, you know, dynamic change is really kind of synonymous with the fashion business. It, the change happens here, uh, probably as fast or faster than any other business. Um, you know, in society today, both from a manufacturing perspective, we're producing, and and from sustainability. And you know, some of the for us, some of the hurdles that we um, you know, we see in sustainability really is some capacity issues and getting buy-ins from all of the um, reliable resources throughout the world because um, there still is a push both ways from, from, again, I've said this before, both from costing and from, you know, things that you really want to be able to do and really can be able to afford. And we know is seeing some of the questions come in, I, I think some questions of, are, are we really seeing uh, consumer behavior if they're speaking about it in surveys or, um, you know, we're hearing it through, through media that consumers are becoming more enlightened. Is that really going to translate through to their spending habits? Um, and are we going to actually see that? And I think David, to, to your point again is, you know, our, what do we do to make those investments in sustainability that, that kind of gets us ahead of the curve? If we saw where we would be in five years, uh, five years ago, what are the types of investments we need to make today? Um, and, and I think really getting to the sense of, you know, as an industry uh, and, and as companies, we're in a hyper competitive landscape, um, you know, fighting for market share. To what extent do all of the panelists, do you see an opportunity for a pre-competitive space um, for the industry to come together and drive uh, accelerated progress. Amy, you referenced uh, 
you know, 2030 climate chart, uh, targets as we think about the sustainable development goals. Um, what would you be your ask of, of the industry and, and colleagues on the panel in terms of thinking about ways to increase this pre-competitive space um, to be able to try to address some of those investment challenges where we could uh, establish greater structures to move the needle on social and environmental sustainability in the supply chain? Well, you know, there's so much already happening out there that's pre-competitive. I mean, many brand, most of us, you know, connect outside of forums like this, and um, we're on we're on shared um, we're in shared working groups um, around all kinds of things: circularity, um, reporting, um, mesh metrics. You know, think about the HIG index. So there's so much happening, and I think what's missing is is really um, there are a couple things. One is um, perhaps this has to happen at the policy level, it probably does, but a real um, push for everybody to be transparent in the same way. So really revealing, um, you know, our carbon uh, output all the way down to the supply chain level as much as we can, or, and, you know, maybe wages within our supply chain, certain things that really are, are meaningful and also touch consumers' hearts um, in a way that you know, we may not recognize right now. Um, the other thing is that I think we need a shared way to, and we have to all adopt it to measure and report out our, um, our impacts. So there are hundreds of different tools that we could be using and we all use different ones of them, right? And if we could just agree on one set, I think that would get us really far. Uh, if I can chime in for a second and perhaps uh, look at this uh, from outside of the industry, um, uh, just as, as a different perspective. You know, when uh, the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, asked the car industry uh, to lower their emissions, uh, many car industries were um, uh, unhappy about it. And fascinatingly enough, what ended up happening is that uh, they uh, they kind of bargained, negotiated with uh, the EPA such that their average um, uh, gas emissions was uh, below a certain level, right? Miles per gallon on average for General Motors had to be below 30. And so uh, regrettably or uh, for strategic purposes, we still see gas guzzlers, right? The big huge trucks and the SUVs that unfortunately some of us still love to drive, but at the same time we have hybrids and whatnot. So what is my point? My point is that I think, you know, whether it be the consumer at the end of the supply chain or whether it be the product lines midstream in the supply chain, um, there is some type of a bifurcation occurring. Uh, we still have consumers that go to Walmart and regrettably don't want to spend the extra 50 cents for an earth-friendly product, yet the rest of us might be. And so we, I think the industry, dare I say, um, uh, perhaps can learn uh, or um, um, leverage that to say, gee, you know, for each of us, we probably want to have product lines that are catered towards in one section of the consumer and one group which is willing to pay and uh, but it's not all gloomy right it's not like well gee you know the other 60 percent or 50 percent are just going to dirty up the world and then <laughs> right the rest of us have to clean it up but over time that education comes into play to say hey listen you know the 50 cents that you just um, um, uh, uh, spent that's not even a cup of coffee yet um, it actually did save um, perhaps a 12-year-old um, in Bangladesh and not necessarily have to do uh, major labor. So well, Rick, I, um, just, oh, sorry, David. No, go ahead. Oh, thanks. So two things I wanted to add, one going to Arash's um, point there about spending more on sustainable products. I think some of the brands that are doing it really well are not the ones that put sustainability front and center. It's not like a crunchy granola type of brand. It's something like an Allbirds, for example. They sell stylish shoes, but they do it in a way that's um, you know, environmentally responsible. Same with Eileen Fisher. Um, and then to your second, or to what you said before, Rick, about partnerships and pre-competitive collaboration, I do think that's a huge area of opportunity. And I agree with you know, everything that Amy said, um, but to taking, taking it to a, a bit of a more tactical level, if we do want suppliers to make investments in sustainable 
processes in sustainable manufacturing, setting up new clean mills in, in new regions, that's incredibly expensive and it requires a lot of investment. Um, so if we're asking those, those partners to do that type of um, investment, we really have to come together as an industry and support those types of initiatives. Um, us as PVH can't support a mill on our own. I'm sure David, your company can't support a mill on its own. Um, so it really does require some partnership and some pre-competitive collaboration to get those types of investments off the ground. And it's not something that you can do overnight. It really does take um, partnership and collaboration in a different way that we've seen today. And I, I agree with that totally. And I think, you know, education really is really the most important thing from the consumer at the consumer level, because you're correct, an extra 50 cents, it's really not that big a deal if you put it in the whole scheme of things. But if you were, if the consumer was educated and you get the buy-in from the retailer to educate, educate the consumer and from the supply chain to help educate the consumer and really understand what it really means from a tr true global perspective, then I think success will happen because that's how everyone measures things here. It's all measured on retail success. Is the consumer buying in? And the consumer will buy in if the consumer understands what they're buying into. Um, I think that's really one of the most important things. And I think as an industry, it's really our job to be able to provide all the facts, all the figures and all the benefits that the consumer may not know about today. And if we can figure out a way collectively to do that, then I think success is, is, is not that far away. Great. So recognize we're short on time um, and we just uh, invite any other closing comments from the, the panelists, but uh, just a brief uh, a note, I think in terms of some of the thematic areas that we touched on, um, you know, understanding we started with in, in the beginning, Amy's comments about the importance of uh, supplier relationships. Um, and I think Sophie reiterated that as well with thinking about our values that drive uh, us to think about who our supply partners are going uh, into the future. Um, and I think as, as David mentioned, thinking about then, well, what are the costs um, associated with that? And how do we make sure that consumers, when they're making the choice, they go into the marketplace, they see a, a wide assortment of products, they know the social and environmental connect, uh, uh, implications of the decisions that they're making when they choose one product or one brand versus another. Um, and noting the role of the industry in a pre-competitive space to be able to translate to the consumer and be able to educate to the consumer. So we're empowering the consumer to make those informed decisions uh, where that infrastructure might not exist in the industry today. I think as Amy, you so well articulated of uh, the number of different forums in which the industry collaborates and the number of different rankings and ratings that might have varying points of view on who may be more socially or environmentally sustainable, but not translate down to the consumer and what is the role of, of policymakers? Um, and uh, I would just open up to the panel for any other closing comments before we wrap this session. And just judging by the questions coming through, we have had a ton of interest. So really uh, wanna thank the audience for sharing those questions. Okay, well with that, I just wanna give a, a huge thanks to Arash, Amy, David, Sophie, uh, for your time sharing your insights. Um, incredibly informative, um, exciting work going on in each of your organizations, uh, but more importantly, a lot of momentum in terms of where do we head as an industry in integrating sustainability into the supply chain. Um, so with that, uh, I'll hand it back. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. thank you so much, Rick, and thank you to all the panelists. This was really an exhilarating session and i think we're going to move on to closing remarks um in in about three minutes so we're going to have a three minute break four minute break and then just convene again uh to close out okay so i think i'll begin um Hello everyone, I hope you had an enjoyable morning. I know that I personally learned an enormous amount and I'm grateful to all the speakers, moderators and presenters who shared their thoughts with us today. Before we say goodbye, I would like to introduce Beverly Eisenbray. She is a Center for Business of Fashion executive board member and a friend who will enrich us with some closing remarks. 
I came to know Beverly years ago when the former RBS Dean Glenn Schaefer suggested she join my task force for creating the business of fashion programs at Rutgers. And I was immediately taken by her and was exuberant to find out she really believed in the mission of the proposed programs. Beverly was instrumental in forming all of our programs on the center and seeing them get off the ground. And I'm eternally grateful to her for her passion, her dedication, her friendship, her mentorship and support. Without her, I'm not sure we would be here today. As a double Rutgers alumna with a BA from Douglas College and MBA from Rutgers Business School and a successful 34 year long career as an executive compensation consultant at Frederick W. Cook & Co. Beverly is an exemplary role model for our students. She serves on the Dean's Advisory Board of Rutgers Business School, where she chairs the Nominations Committee and the Foundation Board of the American Association for Cancer Research, where she chairs the Governance Committee. Additional board experience includes Advisory Board of Compensation and Benefits Review, Advisory Board of the New Jersey Chapter of the National Association of Corporate Directors, Rutgers University Trustee, and Rutgers University Board of Overseers. She has also generally supported generously supported programs such as Rutgers Women Build, which is business undergraduates and leadership development that empower young women and outside RU has lately turned to film producing and has backed projects such as the film Equity that portrays strong women in the business world. Now she is supporting the Master of Science and Business of Fashion program in yet an, another way by creating a fellowship for eligible Rutgers alumni who are admitted to the program and who have shown leadership promoting women. This generous scholarship has created much excitement at the school and for prospective new students. Beverly, thank you, and I'm looking forward to hearing your remarks. So thank you all, thank you, Tavi, and thank you all for attending our virtual annual research conference for 2020. We are particularly grateful to our board members and sponsors and moderators who contributed their guidance and time in creating this conference. And first, a huge thank you to Gal Atia, who is the Business of Fashion Program Coordinator. She kept the whole conference on track and was available nearly round the clock to help communicate to all of us. The IT and art departments at our conference sponsor, Errant Fox, created the striking invitation and agenda that you've seen. Thank you there to Josh Gomby, Kristen Frazier, and Alexandra Zella. The Rutgers Business School IT team of Shavon Jackson, Roland Privet, Max Biles, Lisa Dedrick have been busy with online teaching at the university and now had had to stop and help us manage the technology, which brought us all together pretty seamlessly in this complicated project here. Um, as many of you know, moving to a virtual setting is no small task. Personally, it has been an inspiration to participate in the development of the Center for the Business of Fashion, led by Professor Tabby Ronan, who also created a unique set of related business school programs at Rutgers Business School to educate future leaders in the fashion industry. Student enrollment has been strong and even during this pandemic, the quality of the students is very impressive. I look forward to watching them progress in the future. The center's focus on research in the fashion industry is also unique. And you have heard some interesting research results today, which can help inform your future decisions at your companies. Our presenters were extraordinary and gave us great insight into the future of fashion a daunting task even in a non-COVID era. Some of the highlights that I learned were that some of you have really focused more on the people in your companies than finance to really keep them safe and working productively at home. Agility has been really important uh, with respect to your financial um, management and working with your suppliers and real estate companies. IT departments have been really leaned on during this time to help people work remotely and also to keep your online security safe. Um, renegotiations of all these real estate leases and thinking about 
how you're going to be, the, the real estate market is going to be moving from maybe in the major cities to the suburbs and to vacation areas and how outside malls are going to be more important in the future after COVID have all been considerations in thinking about future real estate. Um, interestingly, um, when consumers are faced with uncertainty, what we've heard is that they tend to want something that is comfortable. They want to get a little bit of control, which is why they all stockpiled all their favorite um, paper products and groceries. And also uh, we learned that now they're willing to try a few new things because they couldn't always find uh, what they looked for in the past. And because we're all so tired of being shut down and feeling sort of downtrodden, now we're treating ourselves to some of your wonderful luxury items. So some interesting things are going on in the, uh, in the world. And in particular, the last, uh, last presentation on sustainability is so important to all of us. Um, I think that it's very heartening to know that how many of the large brands are looking at the entire supply chain now and trying to work with um, their vendors to have the uh, sustainability and, and better humane treatment throughout the world. So it's a lot in one morning. Um, goodbye for now. We look forward to seeing you in person next year. Thank you and goodbye.